And more importantly, happy holidays. This is our, our uh, December meetup, so I probably won't see a lot of you uh, until the new year. I'd like to acknowledge some of our uh, sponsors. Uh, thank you to NumFocus for sponsoring this meetup group. Thank you to TD Ameritrade, my employer, for providing this uh, venue. As well as thank you to Midas for providing the food that you're enjoying. A couple of important points, especially for folks who are new here. Emergency exits. There's one right here to my right. And also through the doors that uh, were out front there, you just turn right and take the stairs. Don't take the elevator in, in emergencies. Uh, always be uh, giving us feedback, uh, either it's Ben or uh, Ben Zeitlin or myself. Feel free to either email us, message us on the meetup group, or just come talk to us afterwards. We'd love any feedback, both positive and especially negative, things that we can improve upon. Uh, also, uh, check out our PyData page if you want to grab uh, speaker decks or get links to uh, our YouTube videos, because all of our talks are recorded and posted on YouTube. So just look for PyData Ann Arbor on YouTube. Uh, as well, um, unless the questions are quick, uh, try to keep them till the end. And also remember that you're in a world space, so do please clean, uh, clean up after yourselves, plates, cups. Uh, the garbage is right by where the food is. I'd like to read our uh, PyData Code of Conduct. So PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion. We do not tolerate uh, harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Uh, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others, do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for PyData. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. But overall, thank you for making this a welcoming and friendly environment for everybody. So just a quick icebreaker so that you can meet somebody new. Uh, hopefully turn to somebody either towards your left or right that you don't know, is a peer of yours, and uh, tell them whether, you, whether or not you like taking notes about you know, talks, uh, on computer or on uh, paper or notebook? Go ahead. Paper. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Your name is. You know. Thank you. It might be an argument. <laughs> you have to add that to the code of conduct. No arguing. Hey. Hopefully, you've met somebody uh, that you've never met before. And. Uh, just a quick plug for this month in data science, there's something new that came out. Have you ever heard of Rapids, which is uh, basically uh, something that NVIDIA is working on with a, a couple of other companies, but it's basically an open source libraries for end-to-end -end, uh, ETL, ex Extract, Transform, and Load, and also machine learning on GPU, so sort of an end-to-end -end pipeline for doing data science, sort of the next generation of this. So you might have seen some of this coming out, so go ahead, go ahead and go and check it out at rapids.ai. Also, like to plug our January meetup event, which is going to be a really good one. And this is with Claire Roberts Thompson from Trace, which is a sports AI company using sensors to understand um, uh, uh, how sports work, or maybe better understanding how uh, a soccer team might benefit from you know on-field experiences. Uh, and the topic of, of the talk is a journey into object tracking in sports. And this will be on Wednesday. I'm highlighting the red here because uh, in the new year we'll be moving on to uh, Wednesdays. And then that will be on January 9th, uh, also at the same time, same location. Uh, quick plug for TD Ameritrade, we are hiring. So we're looking for a researcher, uh, probably a few developers, engineers, and data scientists. So if you're interested, you can talk to me, uh, but also Logan Alstrom over there. Probably we'll, we'll have a couple of roles open, but feel free to, to chat with us even after the fact too. Uh, any calls for community announcements? Whether you're looking for a job, posting a job, or just at, at looking for people who have similar interests to you. Ben. Every month. Um, I am looking for a data scientist, uh, like a lead data scientist for a client in Canton. You have to have a pharma background and, and a whole bunch of uh, DevOps and that kind of people if anybody wants to move to Seattle. So, see me afterwards, thanks. <laughs> anyway, at the back. Yeah, um, not a job or anything, but if there's a mathematician in the room, I've got a question I'd like to bounce off the yeah, other meeting. Any mathematicians? Right? You know who to see. Uh, any other announcements? Going once, going twice. All right, great. So today we have a, a great talk. We have uh, Hitham Maya as well as Brandon Stangy, 
who'll be telling us about uh, uh, different methods for model interpretability. So, thank you. All right. Uh, so, my name is Haytham Maya, Brandon Stange, and uh, we're excited here to be talking about methods for interpretable machine learning. Um, please feel free throughout the talk to like post stuff on here, and I should see it up here. And if it kind of relates to what I'm talking about, we'll, we can answer the questions as we go along. Um, so, Brandon and I work at Joule, so just going to do a quick spiel about Joule. Um, Joule is a purpose company. Um, so what that means is at the individual level, we provide a mobile app experience that helps users uh, live a healthier, more purposeful life. Um, at the organization level, we provide insights about the organization's population um, and provide suggestions about ways that an organization can improve and make help their employees reach their full potential. Um, so in considering a topic for this talk, um, Brandon and I were kind of exploring some of the problems we commonly face um, at Joule, um, and a lot of them may be very familiar to, do, uh, to you. Um, some of those involve uh, building user trust um, alongside our like, uh, predictions and recommendations that we give to users, um, as well as convincing domain experts in the health and wellness industry that our mo models are learning what we expect them to learn and that they make sense. Um, and so that kind of leads us to talk about interpretability. Um, and so to begin with, uh, what do we mean by interpretability? There's obvious, you probably have an idea of what it means, um, and there's different ways you can measure it. Um, so uh, in order to have an interpretable, interpretable model to start with, you kind of need a stable model where you can get uh, reproducible predictions. Um, but furthermore, you will probably want to know a little bit about what features were most important when making a prediction in a model. Um, you're probably going to want to know something about how relationships between certain uh, features resulted in a certain prediction. Um, and then you probably even want to know, like, how easy is it for people to understand what a model has learned about your data? Um, and so kind of different levels of interpretability and different ways you can measure that. Um, and so the question, it begs the question, well, if we care about interpretability, why not just choose the most interpretable models out there and, and just dump out the rest? Um, and so this kind of uh, explains the fact that there are a lot of times you have to deal with a lot of other considerations, one being the whole accuracy, accuracy versus interpretability trade-off, where certain more complicated models can do better with more complex problems in terms of accuracy, but with that complexity creates um, harder to interpret models. Um, and it kind of brings the term black box models, where you pop in the data, get the results, and just trust that it works. Um, other, there are also other considerations, including computational restrictions and restrictions in terms of the data that you have and the amount of it you have. Um, but this kind of uh, lends itself to like discussing like the whole Kaggle effect that we've been seeing, where um, we keep increasing complexity to squeeze out as just as much accuracy as possible with the data without really considering interpretability. Um, and so why do we care about interpretability? Um, and I was actually quite surprised to see how um, in this Katie Nuggets poll um, that there are quite a lot of machine learning practitioners out there that really do care about interpretability, um, uh, even with all those Kagglers out there. So. Um, one of the first um, reasons we care about interpretability is um, we need to understand what a model has actually learned from the data to address the problem being solved. Um, and so with a lot of generalization problems, you kind of uh, explaining why a prediction was made um, can help detect uh, problems with overfitting and explain if a model is learning what is expected that you're learning. Um, in the example here on the left, this comes from a popular uh, paper about the Lime package. Um, and in here you're seeing uh, uh, this is providing an interp interpretability for a classification problem where a model is classifying uh, an animal as either a husky or a wolf. Um, 
And what this is showing you here is that the model is uh, predicting a husky because of, uh, or predicting wolves because of the snow um, versus actually looking at the animal. Um, and so um, things like uh, interpret this kind of shows you like some of the significant benefits of um, having interpretability even in complex models is that there's lots of implications, especially in very sensitive domains like in healthcare where spurious correlations can exist and will not always exist when making predictions and can result in uh, non-truthful predictions um, in cases where it can really impact people's lives. Um, secondly, um, models don't really care what's in the data. They learn what they learn. Um, and so because of that, that can result in models learning about bias, uh, learning from biases in the data. Um, and so we have lots of examples here where, in the news, where models exhibit gender and racial biases and other kinds of biases. Um, and um, on the example on the left here, we actually see an uh, uh, example of like pre-trained word vectors um, trained off of the Google News data set um, exhibiting clear gender biases. Um, and what you see here is a paper that was trying to uh, de-bias these word vectors and um, showing you here on the x-axis she to he and on the y-axis not gender neutral to gender neutral terms and you can clearly see on the top right um, what's supposed to be gender neutral terms um, correlate more for uh, words like brilliant genius buddy uh, cocky on the he side and then things like dress and earrings and pageants and sewing on the she side um, and so you can see lo there's lots of examples like this where biases can exist um, uh, and uh, beyond that um, one key thing is you kind of need to be able to audit a model especially when it comes to um, working with domain experts um, Domain experts, beyond single decision, uh, deci uh, single prediction points, domain experts will probably want to walk through the decision-making process of a model um, in order to verify what a model has learned and making sure that it can be verified by their domain knowledge. Is it backed by science? Um, does it make sense? And then uh, furthermore, uh, to check the safety of the model and then identify cases where models will fail. Um, this is critical in things like the FDA and healthcare where models could make medical decisions can have implications on the life of a patient. Um, and then another thing that we face at Juul a lot is user buy-in. We need to build user uh, trust. These are some common pieces of feedback that we've seen, um, kind of summarized um, issues related to users being skeptical of the predictions being made. Um, not showing enough proof uh, of the logic and the decision-making process and why certain predictions were made um, is a common theme. And so being able to explain what a model is doing with the data and then furthermore being able to explain the reasoning behind certain predictions is critical for building user trust. And then there's also cases where we kind of have no choice. Um, for example, in the uh, finance industry, you might be dealing with the Fair Credit Reporting Act where you kind of need to explain to consumers the, what information was used to deny their credit. Um, or in the FDA, where you want to be uh, able to audit a model and explain the decision process so that they can verify patient safety and restrictions around the use of certain um, products. Um, and then pretty recently, uh, examples with GDPR, which we're still unsure about the legal implications of interpretability, but it shows that the public is becoming more and more concerned with uh, what automated decision-making processes are doing and requesting explanations for how their personal, personal data is being used on those processes. Um, and so um, providing methods for interpretability is kind of key here for even for the public interest, regardless if you're legally required to. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about why we care about interpretability, we're going to kind of give you a brief survey of some popular models out there and um, discuss their level of interpretability. Um, and so to start with, we kind of talk about here um, what we consider perfectly interpretable 
um, approaches, and we say perfectly because here these are models that are interpretable by their very nature. Um, in a lot of cases, though, you might be uh, sacrificing accuracy um, for this interpretability, especially with complicated problems. But um, in turn, the models can be better understood by people. Um, so one of the most interpretable analyses you can do here is uh, um, with uh, the potential for sacrificing accuracy is rule-based analyses. Um, these are very interpretable because they're easy to understand and explain how predicting an association um, between factors can be inferred by co-occurrences in the data. Um, you can also support conclusions here with a certain level of certainty. So you can actually say things to users even that if A and B occurs, C occurs, and we're certain about this because uh, it happens about 80% of the time. Um, so pretty straightforward um, in terms of interpretability of this, of this approach. Um, a little more complicated but still very interpretable um, are decision trees. Um, and so here, split points on certain variables can produce easy to follow decision workflows. And it's very intuitive to explain how certain segmented outcomes became about, um, along with your confidence in those outcomes. Um, a key thing to note here about decision trees is that um, interpretability heavily relies on the size of the tree as well as the path length of the tree, um, because really complicated trees will result in a lot of cognitive load and will be very hard to follow depending on who the person is that's trying to interpret the model. Um, and then you have examples with uh, linear regression and logistic regression. Um, in these examples, they both kind of follow the similar concept of modeling the correlation between certain factors um, in a given outcome. And here, although the parameters that are learned are more complicated than interpreting a decision tree or association rules, um, they're still very interpretable. Um, because they explain what the model has learned about the relationships between the factors and the outcomes. Um, it also tells you how confident they are in those relationships through p-values. Um, so uh, with linear regression, the point estimates determine uh, directly the correlation between features. Um, with logistic regression, you've learned uh, parameters that can be used to calculate the likelihood of a given outcome given a certain feature. Um, so one considerable limitation here is that these models, uh, uh, in hopes of improving accuracy, you could engineer features. Um, but those features could, that you're engineering, you've got to be careful and make sure that they're interpretable by their nature, too. Um, so with more complexity, you get uh, less interpretability here as well. Um, and so I'm going to hand off the mic to Brandon, who's going to start to talk about some of the more semi-interpretable approaches. Uh, any questions so far um, before Hatham goes too far? <laughs> yeah. In the slides that your colleague was just presenting in the upper right, you had things like sklearn. Yeah. Um, so we did that. We identified a few Python packages or, or Python functions that uh, implement these methods as just kind of a nice helper uh, and make it a little bit more related to data since we're here um, and those exist kind of throughout the whole presentation so yeah Clayton is logistic regression as interpretable as linear I mean there's definitely a difference right when you're calculating an odds ratio you have to convert it back uh, from the, the logistic transformation um, and uh, the, the equation itself is multiplicative instead of additive, but it is all—it's it, still fairly interpretable, I would say. Yeah, in the back. I think Chuck. As you get multiple competing hazards, multiple outcomes in logistic regression become less and less interpretable. Yeah, that—that that makes sense. And the stats guy would definitely call me on that. So, <laughs> thanks, Chuck. Um, any, any other questions before we move on? Cool. So we're going to talk about um, methods that are a bit in the middle here. So not perfectly interpretable, but uh, contain some approach uh, for interpretability as kind of a byproduct of the model itself. Um, and, and this is often expressed one way through variable importance. So if you're familiar with um, 
uh, a random forest. This is often a byproduct of calculating a random forest. You'll end up with something uh, like a variable importance plot here. So this is just an example of a ranking of uh, all of the variables and how uh, important they are to any given outcome. Um, so how uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with like, random forests and kind of how they work. Um, but it's a combination of many simple decision trees and how we arrive at this um, importance is um, whether any particular feature is included or excluded, uh, we can calculate the uh, accuracy of any particular, any individual tree in this kind of random forest. Uh, and if we average across all of those uh, instances where uh, a feature exists and doesn't exist, we can kind of derive the, the importance of that feature. So basically, if it's left out, how far does the accuracy drop um, across the model? Um, uh, it also works with uh, gradient boosted machines. Um, you can actually use this method through uh, any algorithm as long as you kind of iterate over the top, meaning that um, if you drop a, a variable and retrain your model, uh, you can sort of calculate the accuracy loss for not having access to that model. Um, so we'll talk about neural network approaches now. Um, and I feel like I skipped one. I did. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of the approaches you'll see for interpreting neural networks are uh, tend to be kind of gradient based. And you'll see the word saliency referenced. Um, and generally, kind of what we're doing here, uh, the, the approach I've mainly used is you take the partial derivative of um, the output with respect to the input, and you end up with a weight for the inputs on how much they influence the output. Um, the, the downside of that is it has to be done kind of after the fact, and it's additional computation that you have to do. It's not built into the training of a neural network by default, generally speaking. Um, another approach that I've seen used is uh, a decoder uh, on top of the neural network to produce images kind of like you see below. Uh, you'll see it highlights kind of areas in the image where it thinks the decision is being made. Um, so uh, the, the bottom tank example here I think is from um, uh, a paper uh, called Picasso or, or that's what the, uh, the algorithm is called. Um, and I'm sure that's in our references here. but. Um, you, you can see it is highlighting kind of areas where the tank is and as we move towards trying to say this is definitely not an amphibian, uh, it, it isn't able to highlight any areas in that image. Um, there are some uh, newer approaches. GradCam um, is one that we came across that seems to be uh, well liked. And what that does for image processing is it takes the, the gradients from the last convolutional layer in a neural network um, and visualizes those weights. So you end up with um, kind of what you're seeing over here on the right in the ability to uh, highlight the dog where the dog is being identified versus the cat. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. That's interesting. I didn't actually notice that. That is sort of a weird. Yeah, I'm not sure. I wouldn't ex wouldn't expect that, um, but I would have to dig into the the paper to see if they comment on that at all. I'm not sure. Um, so uh, another interpretability approach you can use with neural networks is uh, through various attention methods, and these have been proven to. Uh, improve accuracy quite a bit. It's um, uh, an approach that's been uh, popularized over the last couple of years and has been kind of marked as state of the art in like various kind of NLP um, approaches. So it's really common with LSTMs um, and, and RNNs in general, recurrent neural networks, um, and has also been used in convolutional neural networks a little bit. And um, so this one works uh, through kind of a memory approach where uh, we store weights uh, outside of sort of the normal uh, path of an LSTM. And by uh, visualizing those weights and what, what seems to be important for that network, uh, we can come up with uh, a, a way to highlight in text or images. 
And, I, and if I remember correctly, the below example was um, like a question and answer type of situation. So some question was posed like, who uh, killed who in this play or something like that? And it ended up being like entity 63 or killed entity 23 or something like that. Um, so this is uh, a pretty easy approach because you get it basically for free. You get, you're going to be improving accuracy most likely. Um, and you can just kind of visualize the um, attention matrix if you kind of do it smartly and structure it well. Um, uh, another approach we came across was pretty interesting, um, uh, where you can actually apply dropout on the inference step of a neural network. Um, and, and this one's a little bit different from the others because it's not really giving you uh, interpretability per se, but it's giving you a distribution on the uh, out, out on the prediction side. Um, so you're not getting a, um, you know, an explanation for, for what's causing uh, the prediction, but you're getting sort of the distribution and the confidence of any particular prediction. Um, and it returns something similar to uh, a Bayesian posterior. Um, and I kind of put a little asterisk on there because I'm not smart enough to understand the paper and the theoretical reasons why that may be true. Um, intuitively, it seemed like you would need to tune the size of the dropout method to sort of control the width of the distribution and make sure it matches with uh, your expectations from the data. But uh, there was an, uh, an approach to kind of calculating the optimal dropout for um, the inference step. Um, the, the downsides of this, it requires many additional computations. You're gonna have to run through any observation, you know, 100 or 1,000 times to calculate the distribution. Um, and uh, I probably should have mentioned that dropout, it basically masks some variables. So um, it, it, you get that variation by basically dropping out various data elements for any given observation. Um, and, and like I said, we, we haven't used this approach, but we thought it was pretty cool. And if there's some theoretical kind of foundation for why uh, the distribution is you know, statistically valid in some way, we thought that, that was pretty interesting. So that, that paper is referenced. Um, this one, I think it's a, a time series um, example. So the axis is, is time and then whatever they're trying to measure uh, on, the, on the y axis. So um, you can just see that uh, as you move across time, there's the, the prediction period and, and the confidence spreads out. So I don't remember exactly what that specific example is for, but um, some time series approach. Um, and this is a paper Haytham found. Uh, this approach is uh, applying a decision tree uh, in a neural network to regularize it. Um, and uh, it seemed like this was going to be you know, computationally intense and, and we're not sure about that. <laughs> so, and I don't know of any actual like, implementations of this. So if you happen to find one, um, we'd be kind of curious to see so we could give it a try. Um, but it basically learns a decision tree while training the neural network. Um, and it regular, regularizes the complexity of the neural network um, through the depth of the tree. So as you move from uh, left to right here, uh, it's increasing the regularization. So on the left is a pretty complex tree. And by the right, you basically get the most simple tree possible, which is just a, a single node. Um, uh, the examples that they give are often kind of healthcare related here. Uh, and, and this isn't something that we've, we've used, um, but we, we thought that was a pretty interesting approach. Um, so if anyone has done anything like that, let us know. That's a, a pretty cool one. Um, so model agnostic approaches. So these are models where, or uh, approaches where you can apply them to any predictive model, uh, any machine learning algorithm and get some interpretability out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is one that we use pretty often at Joule, actually. And uh, it's, it's super simple, and I haven't seen too many people kind of talk about it, and I don't know if, if that's because it's super obvious or people don't think about it or, or, or what. But um, you can get interpretability out of a network just by varying the inputs uh, and measuring uh, the outcome from that particular model. Um, so an example um, might be like housing prices. If I want to figure out um, which kind of project I should take on around the house, um, 
uh, like revamping a kitchen or adding a bathroom or something, I can actually adjust my observation to you know reflect those changes, run it through the predictive model, and get you know a, an expected price for a house. Um, so we use this at Jewel uh, pretty often just to explain um, uh, I explain predictions to users in the sense that uh, you know if we're predicting like how you're going to sleep tomorrow or, or today. Um, we want to give kind of some feedback for what can you do to kind of optimize that. And depending on the day, it might be something like you know, being more active or eating more healthy or something like that. So we can provide targeted feedback to users um, through this pretty simple approach. Uh, the downside is it requires pretty careful planning and understanding of the problem and the data um, because you can easily apply uh, transformations to your data that um, are sort of invalid, that you don't see often enough in the data to make sense. Um, so an example might be uh, like adding too many bathrooms to a house where it doesn't exist or um, something like that. So uh, other downsides is this requires multiple uh, predictions on the same observation. So um, it can get pretty out of hand if you want to do all combinations of all your variables. But it works really well in kind of a targeted situation where you want to say, um, you know, of these five or ten inputs, if you increase each of them by 10%, you know, what's the expected uh, change in the outcome variable? Um, uh, one of the complicating factors is uh, variables tend to move together. So um, if you're adding um, an expansion on your house, you're going to add square footage and rooms and maybe a bathroom or something all together. So uh, depending on the type of predictive model you use, you may want to move variables together. Um, and this is the, um, the most core kind of Python package. Uh, I think this one started as a Python package, and it might be uh, available in R and, and other languages now. Um, but it's LIME, uh, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations, and uh, that's a pretty tortured uh, acronym. <laughs> but um, here it is, and it works basically the same way by uh, perturbing the input data and measuring the uh, effect on the outcome of a predictive model. Um, and generally, you're kind of zeroing out regions of an image. Or, or an image in this case, uh, but it works for kind of any type of data, and they're continually adding more. Um, so you can see on the image case, uh, they, they do kind of create some like super pixels in areas of the image, um, and then basically they blank out areas of the image and then run that image through the predictive model to see kind of what has uh, the most impact. Um, uh, they also uh, fit a, a linear model over top of that and then actually just interpret that, that linear model. Uh, there's also a text example down here um, where the words that are um, most similar or most predictive of you know, uh, any particular outcome can be highlighted, um, but it works with tabular data, text data, image data, and they're uh, always expanding it. So um, if you're looking for something easy and you want to um, basically apply it to some method that's considered black box, like a neural network, this is a really good way to go. Um, obviously, the downside is anything that you're doing um, on top of an, an additional model like this requires kind of additional computation. So you want to keep that in mind if you're going to be uh, using kind of these interpretations and presenting them back to users and, and doing that sort of thing. Um, so takeaways. Yeah, sure, shoot. Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so he, he was uh, uh, highlighting that uh, local is kind of the first word in Lime here. And uh, reading the paper, what they mean by local is basically that they're taking one observation, so like one house price prediction, all the features going into a house price, um, and perturbing those. Uh, and then they use a, a weight for the similarity to the original that they also feed into that linear model. So what you end up with is um, local, meaning what is the impact on this observation on the outcome. It's not trying to learn the whole model. Um, so any interpretation you get from that, it's really based on that observation. It's not attempting to uh, explain the whole model. It's only useful in that case. 
Any other questions before we kind of uh, summarize here? In addition to just like computational time, is there any advantage in using neural network specific approaches versus something that's model agnostic? Um, I, I would say, I mean, for, for accuracy, I, I, there are some uh, neural network approaches that kind of you do get for free a little bit, like the intention approach. Um, uh, and I think based on the complexity of what you're trying to explain, there might be some benefit to trying to uh, take advantage of that free computation. Um, other than that, um, we're kind of big fans of the model agnostic approaches because they work really broadly. Um, but obviously, if you're doing something like uh, like scientific research, you know that's why uh, linear and logistic models are so popular because they're you know free. They're, it's the whole point of the model is to explain it. You're not really shooting for accuracy most of the time. Um, so uh, basically, we're just uh, summarizing kind of the difficult to interpret approaches to the perfectly interpretable approaches, uh, and this is everything we just kind of reviewed. Um, but the, the major takeaways are uh, sometimes, depending on your use case, interpretability can be as important or more important than pure accuracy, which is sort of different than a lot of the literature you end up reading. Um, Haven mentioned Kaggle, and uh, a lot of the blog posts seem to really focus on accuracy and quite a bit less on interpretability. But that being said, there's a, a pretty good amount of um, research and, and blogs uh, discussing interpretability. Um, you can always default to using more interpretable models. Um, you know, why use something like a neural network if a linear model works and you're focused on interpretability? So it really comes down to kind of the use case. Um, keep, your, keep the audience in mind. Um, there, there's a big difference in trying to explain uh, the whole model at once. What, what is the decision framework that an entire model is making? versus what is the decision a single observation um, is making. Uh, and, and that's a great point for Lyme, so thank you. Um, but if you're trying to explain the whole model to you know, like a research partner or scientists or something like that, um, you're probably going to want to use a different approach than, um, than if you need to explain like a single observation to an individual user. Um, consider your limitations and bias in the data. And uh, several methods exist for interpreting kind of black box models, which we just talked about. Lime is, is a great example of that. Um, we have some good reads here. Please feel free to poke through. Um, most of these papers are kind of referenced somewhere in the presentation. So if you saw some images that were not attributed correctly, <laughs> they come from one of these. Um, thanks to Clayton for pointing out one of these papers, um, what my deep learning model uh, doesn't know. Oh, actually, no, is the first one. The Mythos Model Interpretability is a great read. It's basically our presentation, but better. Um, and other than that, uh, we'll take uh, any questions. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what do we think the future interpretability requirements are for something like GDPR? And uh, if I had the answer to that, I would be really wealthy, I think, or something. But um, the, the way we've decided to address it, because um, we wanted to plan you know, we, in case our users travel to Europe or, or if we get uh, a client in Europe, is basically that we're explaining what we're doing with your data. Um, and whether a user is putting in data in, in their phone or we're getting it through like a Fitbit or something like that, we basically say, here are the broad kind of data elements that we're using. Um, you know, your location, your user enter data, your kind of uh, tracking data, and we're using it to kind of build a prediction or make recommendations to you. So that's kind of the extent at which we're trying to comply with GDPR right now. Um, I don't think it's been settled in the courts yet about um, what like meaningfully interpretive uh, interpretable means. Yeah. It can actually have a positive side effect if you don't need to collect data that are proven to be not needed because your interoperability shows that it's been less used, then you can just not collect it and kind of reduce the amount of data that's harmful. Harm 
Yeah, and, and uh, for those who can't hear, the point was that um, f with looking at model interpretability, you may find out that certain data elements aren't useful and you no longer need to collect them. Um, some of the model agnostic approaches um, seems maybe that they could be insufficient to your users, I guess. Uh, for instance, if you're saying, oh, uh, I predict or <laughs> you should sleep more tonight. Right. Uh, and then your user says, well, why? And you say, well, because our model predicts you need to sleep more tonight. Right. Um, so in your experience, has that been sufficient or are you aiming for an even higher level of interpretability? No, we definitely uh, try and give a more interpretable answer there. So. We, we definitely will say something like, uh, you know, on days where it's high humidity, you tend to sleep worse. Um, what can you do to kind of uh, account for that and then adjust for that? Uh, so we definitely try and meet that uh, slightly higher bar of interpretability. Um, it's been six months that I have been working on interpretability for my PhD. Well, I'm sorry you're here. <laughs> yeah, don't ask too hard of a question. <laughs> They just propose something, but they, what they really do is that interpretability is explaining the model, explaining like uh, the mechanism of the model. Is a linear model, is a decision tree, is a neural network, what the model does. But in, if, we, if we use analogy as a human, as a highly intelligent machine, if someone asked me why I came to this talk, I would say, I would say, okay, this is a nice talk, an abstract interpretable solution or uh, statement to you. But can I, can I ask you to pose the question? What's the question to our speakers? So what's, uh, what, 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 the, what do you see in interpretability? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure we highlighted this as well as we had planned. Um, but I think kind of that first slide here is, uh, is sort of posing that question. Like, what do we mean about interpretability? And, and to us, I think um, it depends on whether you're trying to explain the model in, in total or if you're trying to explain one observation. I think that those are two pretty different things. Um, and and I, I don't have a great answer to, for you. I, I guess I would say um, the, the mythos of model interpretability, or whatever that paper is called, does a, a better job than we would in describing kind of what does interpretable mean. And I think that was basically the highlight of the paper that, it, that no one has a real definition. We all sort of think we understand. We, we understand what interpretable means, but it really depends on your use case, I think, in, in my opinion. And I think what you're kind of implying here is like you we're all striving to kind of get to that like most stringent level of defining interpretability is the level of human understanding for why something was made and what you actually mean with the prediction. So um, yeah, I don't think it's quite well defined and if it, 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 it's kind of one thing that you could do at a company is as a best practice is can you define some sort of uh, numerical score or quantitative measure of interpretability um, when defining a model? Is that possible? I'm not sure. Um, but poses some interesting questions. Clayton? In the beginning of the talk, you had mentioned bias as sort of a motivating factor for being interested in, inter in interpretability. Can you tie any of the sort of the methods for interpretability that you talk about back to addressing the question of bias? Yeah, so, I mean, so that's obviously a super hard problem because it's not as simple as just like removing gender or remo removing race uh, out of your data, right? Just removing that feature doesn't necessarily uh, remove all, all of the bias that exists. Um, for, for something like um, job titles, uh, it, you have to do a lot more massaging for the data or, or for the model itself to kind of remove that bias. Um, and I, I've seen a few papers that claim to kind of work on it, including that word vector paper that, that Haytham mentioned. Um, I don't know of any, uh, it, it's definitely not a solved problem, I'm sure. Um, and, and I think a lot of uh, a, approaches either just want to make you aware of it or m hopefully maybe trying to remove those data elements kind of gets you, you know, 80% of the way there, but I'm, I'm not sure if it really does. Any other questions? So all, your, uh, all of your work is mostly related to finding a cause and effect more than correlation. Interpretability usually gives you only the correlation, but do you have any 
tips on how to later claim causality? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, the, the question was uh, around causality, and isn't that what we're really after? Um, yeah, probably. Uh, that's, a, that's a much bigger, harder topic <laughs> than I think I would ever want to bite on. Um, and I know there are some approaches kind of approaching causality or claim to approach ca causality uh, through data, but um, I, I definitely don't have an answer for that question. Last question. Chuck. Back. Do you have any procedures or processes in your company where you try to avoid overly trusting your own models that you're building? Um, yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the question was, do we use any approaches uh, in our company um, to avoid over-trusting uh, any particular model? And I think Haytham had an answer, because I can't think of one. Well, I mean, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of, um, should be fine. Um, uh, when verifying our, our models, we don't just kind of ship them to production once we find that there's good accuracy. Um, there's a lot of what we do is like walking through the models and um, showing a lot of example cases from our production data and looking at the recommendations. And a lot of times we'll throw them, uh, throw some of those recommendations that we would that we simulate to uh, domain experts that walk through that and verify does this actually make sense? Because you could get cases that I don't know, like in healthcare, for example, where uh, you can treat a disease by killing a patient. <laughs> uh, so uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot of like business logic and filtering through and working working with domain experts in certain areas to make sure what your model's doing is valid, sound, follows domain knowledge. Great. So let's thank uh, Brandon and Hitham here.